Chapter 2, Danny. Danny Greenbow's Park, Los Angeles, California, Wednesday, 10 May, 7 a.m. Danny groaned as her cell phone rang again. The tinkling bell alerting her to the incoming call was less than welcome, considering how badly her head hurt. That second bottle of wine was definitely a bad idea, she decided. She reached toward her nightstand, groping for the phone. Yeah, she growled without bothering to look at who was calling. Danny Greenbow, is that any way to answer your phone? Demanded a somewhat irate voice. Danny grimaced. Sorry, Mom, she replied contritely. Oh, God, I need an aspirin. Celebrated a little too hard last night, did we? Danny had turned 29 the day before and gone out with friends for dinner and drinks to celebrate. The party had been epic. Ugh, answered Danny. Why are you calling, Mom? This is my annual Alcohol is the Devil's Brew lecture. Danny's mother snorted in obvious amusement. Actually, sweetheart, I'm calling to remind you the party is over and you need to get your butt out of bed and go to work, her mother said, not unkindly. I figured you might have gotten a little carried away last night and could use a wake-up call. Danny peered at the bedside clock, fetching her glasses so she could see the time. Shit, she yelled, leaping out of bed. She had to be at work in less than an hour. With L.A. traffic, like I said, her mother went on in an unmistakably prim tone. Mom, I gotta go. Thanks for the call. Bye. Danny tapped the screen of her cell to end the call. She raced for the bathroom, calling over her shoulder. Sorry, Henry. Mama's gotta hurry. Behind her, a furry, white, wheat and terrier gave her a baleful look, no doubt thinking some very disapproving doggy thoughts before rolling over and shutting his eyes. Just in Time Solutions, Los Angeles, 10.30 a.m. Danny sat in her cubicle sipping a mug of coffee and staring at a screen full of code while trying her best not to snap at her co-worker. Anyway, Ben droned on, leaning against the entrance to her cubicle. I'm just saying, Ben, sweetie, in all honesty, I have no idea what you've been saying, the brown-eyed woman replied dryly. I'm trying to puzzle out why this program is still glitchy. The irritating man gave a long, suffering sigh, causing Danny to stop what she was doing and turn to give him her full attention. You're always busy, he whined, like at your party last night. Aha, she thought, so that's what's eating him today. Ben most definitely had not been invited to the celebration, but had shown up anyway. Of course, Dan, Danny hadn't done more than say, hi, Ben. Ben, sweetie, we've talked about this, haven't we? She asked patiently. Pookie? You need to get yourself a girlfriend, she instructed him in a tone much like her mother used at times. I am trying, you know, he said slyly. Yeah, but I'm not going to be that girl, she said gently. Listen to me. You aren't my type. That isn't going to change. Yeah, yeah, I know, he replied. You like bad boys. What is it that the cool chicks never want a nice guy, the young man demanded, the wine creeping back into his voice. I like nice guys, Ben, she corrected him. And yes, you're nice, but, sweetie, you just aren't my type of nice guy. She reached up and gave his cheek a gentle pat. Trust me, Ben, the right girl is out there somewhere, she promised. Albeit I have no idea where exactly, and if I did know, I don't know if I'd give him directions or warn her, she thought, fighting back a smirk. Now... How about you get back to work before one of those meanies from HR comes by and gives you another one of their little talks? Another talk, that is. Ben sighed heavily, sagging a little. Okay, he said, finally moving off. As Danny turned back to her computer, another form filled her cubicle entrance. Ben hassling you again? asked an attractive, dark-skinned woman. Danny just shrugged. It is what it is, she answered. I don't know why you don't sick HR on that little twerp, Betsy asked. I don't know, Dan replied. Maybe because it always seems to do more harm than good? Or because I don't need anyone else help dealing with a guy with a crush? That's what they're there for, you know, Betsy reminded her. Betsy, I have a ton to get done, and I'm fighting an absolute killer of a hangover right here. You and me both, sister, Betsy informed her. The woman had been one of the so-called friends who had participated in the previous night's festivities. Looking up at her, Danny realized the other woman looked a little wan under her mocha skin. Danny snorted. That'll teach you to try and hang with the big dogs. I think you just have an unfair advantage when it comes to packing away the hooch, Betsy teased. It's genetics is what it is. You mean because I'm white? Danny asked innocently. 
Betsy had a fair amount of Indian in her ancestry. No, because that Y chromosome you're sporting, her friend replied tartly. Anyway, I actually stopped by because we found another glitch in the firewall software package. You're kidding me, Danny groaned. Saving her work, she accessed the firewall folder on the server and pulled it up on screen. What is it now? Danny Greenville's apartment, 8.30 p.m. Danny sat on her couch rubbing Henry's belly. The dog nearly purred as his tail slowly wagged back and forth. Who's a good boy, Henry, huh? Who's mama's good boy, she chanted while giving his belly a good scratch. Danny was dressed comfortably in boxers and printed with the Millennium Falcon in a brown t-shirt that entreated, Oh, John Ringo, no. The decor of the young woman's apartment revealed a lot about her. Pictures of her family, snaps of her mom, her brother, her late father in his marine dress uniform, family portraits from her youth, hung on the walls and filled frames on nearly every available surface. A framed Firefly poster hung next to a picture of Joss Whedon on one side of her TV, while pictures of Spock, Leonard Nimoy, not Zachary Kinto. Danny was an original series girl. And the Enterprise decorated the wall on the other. Flanking the TV were a pair of Ikea bookshelves, sagging under the collected works of Larry Correa, Eric Flint, Sarah Hoyt, John Ringo, and David Weber. Flint's latest opus lay on the coffee table, a bookmark indicating she was around two-thirds of the way through while a 3D chess set was carefully centered on one end of the table. Danny Greenbow was definitely a sci-fi nerd. A sexy nerd, sure, but a nerd nonetheless. More than one guy had informed her that she was every boy's dream girl. Of course, several of those guys had no interest in taking advantage of said sexiness, but Dana was packing in her boxers saw to that. Not that she hadn't found a couple of great boyfriends over the last eight years... Gently pushing the dog out of the way, Danny opened her laptop and navigated to her favorite blog. Seeing that Ace of Spades had posted a new rant about the president, she read through it, nodding as she read, You got that right, she agreed. At the sound of her mom's ringtone, Danny set the computer aside and quickly answered, Hi, Mom. How are you feeling, honey? Not bad. Long day, though, she replied. I just wanted to see if you made it through the day in one piece. Have you sworn off the devil rum for another year? Danny snorted. Mom, you know the whole temperance movement is dead, right? She teased. Carla Greenbow snorted right back at her. You say that now, she replied. But just wait until you have a daughter. Danny's heart thumped. While Carla had been supportive of her transition from the start, it had taken the older woman a while to get into the habit of referring to the young woman as her daughter. This was the first time she had suggested Danny might have children of her own eventually. There had been some teasing hints during each of their, her serious relationships, but this was a bit out of the blue. Don't you suppose I should find a man first, she asked, one who will stick around for the long haul? This is 2017, sweetheart, answered her mother. Gloria Steinem may not be in vogue anymore, but lots of women are having kids on their own. I'm no feminist harpy, Mom. Husband first, then kids, just as God intended. Carla laughed out loud. Oh, just as God intended, huh? Danny had never shared her mother's Catholic faith. Another thing that made Carla a great mother to her two children was that she had really was understanding about just about everything. Whether she agreed with her kids or not, she was always in their corner. That's right, Missy, Danny affirmed, laughing. So, how's the search going? Any prospects? Danny frowned. Wait a minute. Are you seriously pushing me to settle down and have kids? Well, you'll be 30 soon. Next year, protested Danny. And a couple grandkids would be nice, her mother continued, talking right over. After a moment, Carla let out a belly laugh. Oh, sweetheart, you are so easy, she teased. Just in Time Solutions, Friday, 12 May, 9.30 a.m. So the bottom line is that despite the current difficulties, the Firewell software package is on track to meet the scheduled delivery date, finished Brian Rockwell. Brian cast a pleading glance at Danny, who sat across the table from him. While I generally prefer to under-promise and over-deliver, began Danny as all eyes turned to her, the current rate of glitches is within expectations. If we were working for the Seattle outfit, the table groaned and booed at the allusion to the Washington-based software giant. We could ship the software as is. However, as we are not they whose names shall not be spoken, Danny continued with a grin, we of course won't do that. 
Still, I agree with Brian. Assuming we keep the number of meetings to a minimum, and assuming we are allowed to keep the currently dedicated personnel on task for the next two weeks, the delivery date is achievable, she finished. Wynona Cross, the VP overseeing, overseeing the firewall project, smiled at the engineers around the table. I think what Danny actually means, she teased, is if we quit bugging her and just follow her instructions to the letter, we'll make our delivery date. Does that about sum it up? The software development team shared a laugh. It was well understood among them all that Danny Greenbow was both the brains and the programming brawn in the room. Very well, Wynona concluded. That's all, folks. Go back to slaving away for the peanuts we pretend to be so generously paying you. Smiling with relief, Wynona Cross had a well-earned reputation as a ball buster. The team got out while the getting was good. Danny, would you stay a moment? called Wynona. The software engineer sat back into a chair. Once the last of the team had left, Brian closing the door as he walked out, Wynona turned to face her star employee. What's up, Wynona? Danny asked. I just wanted to touch base, her boss assured her. It's important to me and to Bob, Robert Mayersall was the founder and CEO of the company, that you know just how much we value you. Danny quirked an eyebrow in a manner that would have made Mr. Nimoy himself proud. We've heard a rumor that they who shall not be named made you an offer, explained Winona. Ah, replied Danny. How the hell did she hear about that? No worries, Winona, she assured her boss. I'm not planning to go anywhere. That's good to hear, Winona began. Of course, Danny interrupted. My continued loyalty to my lords and masters, peace be upon them, would be even better assured if you could convince Josh Whedon to bring back Firefly. Wynona gave her a blank look for a long beat and then blinked. A smile crept across her face. Get this done for De uh, Danny and I'll figure out how to shake something loose for you to show us our, your appreciation. Nodding, Danny stood to leave. You know why you were so damn good at this job, Danny? Wynona asked as the young woman reached the door. Danny paused and looked at the VP. You're just weird, her boss said, smiling. Danny laughed, gave Wynona a wink, and walked out of the conference room. Just in Time Solutions, Saturday, 13 May, 4.15 p.m. Danny had come in early that morning to continue debugging the software package. She was confident she would be able to get through most of it before Monday if she could just avoid distractions. She really wanted that raise that Winona had hinted at. After what seemed like just a couple of hours, she blearily looked up at the wall clock and was startled to discover that she had been hammering away at the code for damn near eight solid hours. Shit! She quickly saved her work and jotted down a couple of notes for herself and then grabbed her coffee cup and headed for the door. The young engineer had a date tonight and she did not want to be late. She'd met the guy, a banker with Wells Fargo, a few weeks earlier. He seemed a little bland, but he was cute and had a great smile. The banker seemed a little soft around the edges for her. She was a woman who appreciated a bit of testosterone in her men. But he'd accepted she, what she was without so much as a blink, and that was rare enough to earn him a shot. Not that he should be counting on getting any tonight. Danny was pretty choosy about who she'd get to bed with. Even without considering the extra risk involved for a chick to quip the way she was, she had always been a little gun-shy in the early stages of her relationship. Ten minutes later, Danny was steering her car out of the parking lot and into the mid-afternoon traffic. Shoppers and moviegoers competed for space on the roads with the early dining crowd and soccer moms shuttling their kids home from practice. Still, she made decent time and was parked in her designated space at the apartment complex within 30 minutes. Henry started whining from the other side of the door as soon as he heard the key hit the lock. Mama's coming, buddy, she called. The minute the door was open, Henry launched his 30 pounds of furry love at her. Who's a good boy, Danny cooed. Does Mama's boy want to go for a walk, see? The terrier howled and wagged his tail with gusto. She laughed at the dog's antics. The pair went through the same routine every day. Okay, buddy, let me drop my bag and we'll head out. But then I've got to get ready to go out. The dog's choppy bark informed her what he was not pleased by this announcement. Hey, ease up, Henry, she scolded him. Mama wants a man, one with two legs, she clarified, dropping her purse and reaching for the dog leash. An hour later, Danny was standing naked, save for her glasses, in front of her mirrored closet door, toweling herself dry from the shower and considering her form with a critical eye. Dropping the towel, she placed her hands on her waist and twisted her hips to the left, obscuring the physical evidence of her maleness from view. 
what she jokingly thought of as her sheenness and exposing half of her tramp stamp. With her shoulder length dark brown hair draped to the left and her firm high breast needing little support, Danny allowed that she made a fetching picture. Smiling in satisfaction, the woman began to dress. After several false starts, including a brief flirtation with a crop top that nicely showcased her belly ring and tattoo, she chose a navy blue midriff top that was tight in the bust with a loose flowing sleeves, matched with a cream colored skirt that ran to mid thigh and midnight blue strappy sandals. Twirling in front of the mirror door, Danny determined it would do. Hotness personified, she complimented herself. What do you think, Henry? The dog canted his head to one side and threw her a skeptical look. Don't be like that, she teased. Trust me, he'll be putty in my hands. 9.30 p.m. Danny was back home shortly after 9.30. Well, that was a bust, she informed Henry as she opened the front door. Apparently overjoyed that her date had gone south so quickly that his person was home in time for snacks and a walk, the dog spun in a complete circle, assumed a pouncing position, and gave a soft bark. What went wrong, you ask? Danny interpreted. He doesn't like dogs. Disgusted, Danny dropped her clutch purse and reached into the snack jar, retrieving a dog treat for Henry. When she held it out to him, the dog stood up on his hind legs, resting one forepaw against her thigh, and gently nipped it out of her fingers. Seriously, who doesn't like dogs, she demanded. In fact, it gets worse. He didn't like cats, either. At the word cat, Henry voiced canine disapproval. I know, I know, cat people are the worst, she agreed. Accepting people who don't like dogs or cats. What the hell, man? Henry whined and glanced meaningfully at his leash. Danny sighed. Okay, boy, she relented. Give me just a minute. The five foot four, 118 pound woman retrieved her whistle and mag light, which she'd chosen for its heft as much as for the power of its beam. Daddy's girl had been raised to be a scrapper. Of course, she hadn't been Daddy's girl back then. After fitting Henry's walking harness around his torso, she led him out the door, down the steps, and around the block. With Henry stopping to sniff every road sign, fire hydrant, and bit of scrap along the way, and with Danny cleaning up his, Henry's mess after he guiltily made a deposit on the sidewalk, the jaunt took them the better part of half an hour. Once back in the apartment, Danny washed the makeup off her face, donned a pair of shorts and a brown t-shirt announcing, Hand Shop First, and settled on the couch with Henry. After a few minutes flipping through the channel, she gave a little yelp. Close Encounters! Henry, it's Close Encounters! She said happily. As the pair settled back into the cushions, Henry snuggled up against his person's thigh. Danny mused, We really need to drive out to Wyoming someday and see Devil's Tower. Henry adjusted his position, resting his head on her thigh and giving her an adoring gaze. Devil's Tower, Henry, she repeated softly, idly scratching her dog behind his ear. Wouldn't that be cool to see?